Welcome to episode 22 of the Hike or Die Outdoor Adventure Podcast. I'm here with my beer swilling and hiking buddy, Craig, as always. <laughs> and it's very sad to be bringing you the very last episode of this podcast for 2019. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you felt slightly sad there for a second as a listener, uh, you're the sort of listener that we need. Yeah. Play that funky music, man. Thank you, as always, to our regular podcast sponsors for their support. Topo Maps Plus, a phone application that allows you to view topographical maps, track your location, even without cell phone coverage. Go deeper into the backcountry. Rios Floating Polarized Sunglasses with 100% UV protection for the love of water. Bluey Merino, Australian super fine merino wool base, mid and top layer garments. Where our story ends, yours is just beginning. Caribbean, one of Australia's leading backpack, travel, and outdoor brands. They supply us with dry bags, waterproof day packs, and expedition bags. Supporting our sponsors allows us to continue to produce this podcast, so please jump online and check out what they have to offer. Hello, good people. Welcome. It is fantastic to have you here. We're pretty pumped. Hey, Craig. Hey, mate. This is, kind of, this is kind of like a work Christmas party, this one, isn't it? It is. It's kind of, yeah, it is exactly that. You've yeah. got enough beer for an entire <laughs> work Christmas party. <laughs> Come on. Three, well, two beers remaining for, for this. That's okay. Oh, you've already finished one. Yeah. That's that took... when he was just doing his research. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while to get started here. Yeah, good stuff, man. Uh, as always, we've got um, uh, later on, there's a few... Uh, Sneaky remarks from Jodes about your drinking. Oh. <laughs> you just can't get away from it, can you? I'm such a target. There's no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what have you been up to? Me? Ah, oh, mate, I've been really busy, but then it's holidays now, so I'm in the zone. I'm, yeah, loving the fact that I can just do what I want when I want at the moment. So I'm relaxing, but yeah, I've been, you know. As long as it's what the kids want. Pretty much. <laughs> I do what I want. When I want, as long as the kids want. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you just brought me down. I, I, I get that though. That's exactly oh, right. Oh, you sounded like you believed yourself for a second there. <laughs> yeah, I was talking that up. No, I do have um, I do have duties of watching the kids at the moment, which you know has its challenges, but its rewards. I've I've been um, working through that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Anything interesting happening? Ah, uh, no, mate. It's um. No, I'm just looking forward to, you know, the silly season. So, yeah, just getting my, my skates on for that, I reckon. What about you? Uh, I don't particularly look forward to that um, this season, to be honest. It's just a bit too manic for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't want to be Debbie Downer, so I'll uh, skip that uh, topic. <laughs> uh, as I was just saying to you before we got on air, I've been doing um, uh, a pretty fair amount of upgrades slash uh, mods and renovations to my uh, pop-top camper. And I wasn't going to mention that, but I thought, hey, this is an outdoor adventure podcast. Mm -hmm. Pop-top campers, man, you don't get any more outdoor or adventurous than that. Yeah. So yeah, I've just been doing things like upgrading the LED lighting because uh, it runs off solar and... Um, yeah, just, just tidying up, fixing little latches and broken stuff. Um, it's obviously it's secondhand, uh, but it's fun. I enjoy it. Um, yeah, no, good mate. times. Yeah. If you can make it your own, if you can add little bits, if you can do stuff like that, have that, you know, the ability to do that. I, I would try, but I may not succeed the way you are. <laughs> so I'm impressed to hear these stories, mate. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks, mate. It's it's going to be pretty cool. I mean, it's already good. There's nothing wrong with it. 100% usable. But uh, after taking it out, we realized that there was things that were just irritating things or it could do with this or it'd be good if it had that. And so I've just been ticking off all of those things. And 
uh, tightening it up. We will, um, had a tiny little leak that was, um, yeah, causing trouble. So that's fixed now. Very nice. Yeah. That's about it, mate. I haven't had time for anything else because I've got to be able to put that thing on the back of the car, uh, next week and drive away with it. And <laughs> it's got to be usable. That's right. Or else Tom ruins the entire family <laughs> holiday. Yes. Oh, that's good, mate. Got something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. yeah where are you going? How far are you going for? Uh, going to a place called Bagara Beach. Oh, nice. Uh, about four hours north of... Near Bundaberg. Yeah, that's it. And it's on the coast. Our uh, campsite is... Or not the campsite, so the caravan platform is the second closest one to the beach. You can... Yeah. Should be able to see it from where we are. Mm, that sounds pretty so, good. Yeah, it should be good. Only going up there for five days, but perfect. That'll be enough. It's that kind of number that's just long enough, but not too long as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you know, that'll five be days without washing the kids gets a bit <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Get them you, back and hose them off. Hope you love it. I hope you survive. No, we'll be good. We'll be good. Um, speaking of washing off, mate, um, was it last night? Or the night before, I was having a laugh today because I remember talking to you about it on last podcast or the one before. I was sitting out under the stars, mate, having a bath in the backyard. <laughs> it's it's set. <laughs> sitting there, laying Surely. in my bath with my feet up, looking at the stars. Right. That's living. Swatting the mozzies. That's great. It is living, mate. <laughs> no, awesome. no, you get underwater, they can only bite your face. <laughs> <laughs> I just pull the hair over like a bit of a mozzie net. That's great, Doug. That's really good. <laughs> hey, but, are you looking for a new job for 20, 2020? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, how about, have you heard about the Antarctic Division looking for new people? No, I wasn't on the email list. Yeah, I was. Okay. i tell you what, this is one of those jobs that I instantly thought if only – this was around, or if only I heard about this when I was, um, you know, in my twenties and single and didn't have debts and all that sort of stuff, I would have jumped at this sort of thing. Mm. So they're looking for about 150 people to fill, um, roles down there. Most of them admittedly are beyond my skills. So they're qualified trades, electricians and mm. engineers and all that sort of stuff. But there's definitely a few in there, like storming and logistics and stuff that you could uh, try and wrangle your way into. Yeah, nice. Uh, there's no rent, no board. Uh, it's it's all free. And every meal is prepared by a chef. And if you get posted there, you get 61K just for being posted there uh, on top of a very generous wage. Really? Yeah. That's your bonus to get shoved down there. Wow. Um, the, I believe there's between six months to 18 months. Uh, I did have that article up. Postings? Yeah, <laughs> six to 18 month postings. Really? Sorry. Um, I got that completely wrong. That's why I have the article here. <laughs> they range from four months to 15 months. Four months in the summer, 15 months over winter. My assumption there is that it gets very difficult to get in and get out in winter. So you're probably stuck almost there. literally stuck there. And the only reason I know that is remember when I um, reviewed that book uh, at the start of the year of that guy who traversed Antarctica and... Mm. Um, when he was trying to get, I can't remember whether he was trying to get in or out, he almost missed a window and he would have been stuck there. It must have been trying to get out. He would have been stuck there for months if he missed that last plane. Yeah, right. That's risky. Yeah, it's full on. But uh, that's why they've got doctors and all sorts of stuff down there. So, yeah, you get a base wage and then you get an allowance of 60K, 61K. Um, and you don't pay any rent. Imagine that, no rent or anything for a year and a half and but no, you, nothing to spend your 61K on. But you haven't signed up? No, I haven't signed up. I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. 
sadly, but yeah. I hope someone out there hears this and goes, well, hey, I'm a qualified tradie. I'm going to have a, have a look at that. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, because it runs through to uh, January, January the 20th or similar. I did have that. Where is it? Uh, applications close January 23rd, 2020. I mention that because there could very well be someone listening who thinks, well, thanks, Tom. I'm going to actually check that out. <laughs> I'll put the links in the show notes. Go nuts. Go for it. And if you do get a position, geez, let us know, please. Please let us know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> be a guest on here. Talk yeah. to us live from Antarctica. Yeah, that'd be wild. Um, I'll tell you something else cool, Craig. There was, there's a really cool story, a news story popped up of a, there's an emu farm in uh, central west New South Wales. That's a state of Australia um, that's below our state. And they're going through some, I mean, everywhere's going through some tough droughts. And what they've done is they've moved all the emus up to a particular paddock uh, just so they can look after them in that one paddock. And so what they've been doing is shutting off the other paddocks and I guess they'll let them regenerate once they do get rain. But they were trying to conserve water as well because there's troughs down in the back paddock. And what they did before, which is a very clever idea actually, what they did before actually shutting the troughs down, they thought we should set up a, uh, what do you call it, like a trail cam, just to make sure there's not anything using this water supply. And the footage that they got was absolutely amazing. Mm. I'll, um, I've seen that. Have you seen this? Yes, I have. So look at that. That's a little echidna. He comes back the next night and um, has a drink with yeah. his tongue. <laughs> and then uh, as this, this video is playing now in front of Craig and I, a massive meter and a half yeah. goannas just jumped in there. Kangaroos actually getting in for a swim. Uh, what are they? Rosellas and uh, black cockatoo. Yep. And then later on there'll be sulfur crested cockatoos and more wallabies. It just blew me away. So now they're actually going to be leaving that trough um, with water in it because they realise how much uh, Australian native wildlife was being mm. was being assisted by that. Yeah, that's pretty eye opening. It, it did make me think twice about that, eh? Yeah, but... it's really cool. Um, and you don't really think of it that way, do you? You don't really think that. No. Uh, any of the food or water you're putting out is helping anything else. But this, yeah. um, <clears throat> there's a funny comment here. They, uh, one night on the trail cam, they saw some spikes at the bottom of the screen and they um, thought it looked like an echidna, but they couldn't actually see it because they didn't think that, or they didn't know that echidnas drank water. And, and now that that's not such a silly comment because they actually get most of the, what they need through the the vegetation and the grubs and stuff they eat. So um, they move the camera down a bit and then the next night in the video, you see yeah. this little echidna pop up the side and then he leans right over and you think, oh, the poor guy can't reach. And then this super long tongue just comes out mm -hmm. and starts drinking out of it. I thought that was a really cool story. Yeah, it is. Uh, given that. Everything's so negative at the moment about the yeah. droughts and uh, all that stuff. How about uh, uh, this for a headline? This is in very, very much in the same vein. This husky leads an ex extraordinary double life. So, um, where's my notes? Oh, I didn't have any. Coda is the name of this husky. It's always been a free spirit. Um, now, what was happening was the um, the dog was taken off. So the husky was taken off into the forest. And I think it got 
Yeah, it had been startled and it ran into a nearby forest. And then the owners basically went home and just hoped that this dog was going to find its way home. Three days later, the dog did wander home. And they thought, oh, wow, um, fantastic, the dog's back. And when they checked the trail camera, I'm not sure if they checked it or it's their neighbours or whatever, it doesn't actually go into specifics in this uh, in this article. But when they checked this camera, the dog, Husky, had been sleeping with this stag, so a male deer, for three nights in the bush. <laughs> What they just been like hanging out? Hanging or out. Been... Look at this. Oh, they've been kissing. Yeah, that's a crazy photo. What the? <laughs> Despite being at very different ends of the size spectrum, Coda somehow befriended a massive male deer. The <laughs> friendship quickly grew into something quite remarkable. Wow, that is <laughs> <It's not> incredible. <laughs> I just, well, I've, I think I've said this before on the podcast. I think I definitely have because um, we were talking about the, um, remember the dingoes that were um, protecting those um, parrots in the termite mounds? Yes. But they only found out about that because of modern technology. This is another one of those amazing things that you just don't know about. It's something, something out of a Disney movie Yeah. where yeah. you'd say, oh, that's, yeah, it's a load of rubbish, the dog. Um, got lost and couldn't find its way home and then it lived with the deer. It's just the silliest thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it happened and it's awesome. Yeah, you wouldn't believe that unless you saw that picture I'm looking Absolutely at. Absolutely wouldn't believe that. that. Look out. at that one where it's sleeping in the, in the grass and the yeah. deer's just going about its business a metre away. Insane. <laughs> cool. I don't think my dog would be, no, oh, no, he is pretty gentle. Yeah, he'd probably be pretty much the same. <laughs> but he wouldn't understand if something was scared of him. He'd, he'd get a shock that something ran away from him. Look yeah. behind him thinking, what, what, there's something behind me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, cool. I'm going to jump to uh, what will definitely start out as a harrowing tale but it's got a pretty good ending and a pretty good message. Did you hear about the um, that knife attack? It must have been about a year ago. No. I'm, um, I'm reading that title. I didn't hear about this. Yeah. Um, so the title of this article is Canadian Hiker Plans to Finish Trek Nearly One Year After Knife, knife Attack on the Appalachian Trail. Uh so that pretty much gives the whole story away, but it's the, in the details where it's, um, I vaguely remember hearing about the original attack, but I didn't know any of the details. So this, this kind of spells out the details and, and it's, it is horrific in that, uh, this guy who was, um, later on, uh, basically sent to a mental institution cause he was very troubled there was um, reports of him harassing people at various points of the Appalachian Trail. She actually saw him the night she got attacked. She actually saw him at a nearby restaurant because um, if you're not familiar with it or if anyone you know from around the world's not familiar, the trail is is extremely long, but there's uh, points where you can jump on and off into little towns, restock, yeah. stay a couple of nights, have a bath or whatever. Um, and so she's gone into a town. She already knew that this guy was out and about and she saw him uh, because he was uh, pretty easy to spot because he was wandering around with a dog. And so she thought the best thing to do was just to um, get her stuff together and get moving and hike and continue on her journey and get further away from him, uh, which is a really good plan. I don't, for a second, I think that's a good plan. Get out of the town, get moving. Uh, but what happened was he wandered onto the trail later that night. So he was um, 
cruising around and and then started threatening everyone. There was only I think three of them in the in the campsite that night, or maybe no four, because he started telling everyone he was going to kill them and why they deserved to die. This, as I said, this is a horrible story, uh, but there's a point to it. Anyway, um, two two people managed to to take off. Um, there was another guy there that. I guess tried to fight him off and ended up getting stabbed to death. And then she got stabbed. There was a somewhere in here it said how many times. So what happened was she basically got knocked on her back and she already had a backpack on, so she was just like a turtle. And he just fell straight down on her and um attacked her. And she literally played dead. Um, actually held her breath and just laid there until he took off. And then she had to hike, um, I think it was 10 kilometers, Jeez. For which took a, a long time. Yeah, she didn't really realize the extent of her injuries, it says. Um, but yeah, she had to um, go for 10 kilometers, which took hours because she'd been stabbed so many times. <laughs> And, um, she got there and she got fixed up and <clears throat> they went and caught the guy and obviously she's, she's gone through all of that, but what she's doing now is getting her stuff together and she's going to go and continue from where she left off and, no way. and finish it, man. So I think, um. I think that's really good. Mm. And she says she's reluctant to accept any praise. And her quote is, uh, I'm happy that if it helps some people cement their decision to stay on the trail, especially since I understand that it's the mental component of hiking the trail that's the hardest for people. But there's nothing special about me, she said. Um yeah, really interesting. It's it's a very long article. It goes into a lot of the detail of the original attack, but it also goes into her talking about her mental journey of of um, you know, trying to get back on track and um mm. as she says here, uh it's not the kind of thing you can walk away from unscathed, but I can say I'm doing blissfully better than I might have expected. I'm doing surprisingly fine. So that's awesome. I Kirby's her name. Kirby. I can vaguely remember this originally, mm. this story. And then, yeah, that would have been traumatic. So this is a personal journey for her, man. Good yeah, this her. is one of those get back on the horse yeah. scenarios, except I wouldn't have held it against anybody for not mm. wanting to do that. But I guess- um, You might it, have said, but how far through the journey was she? Um, oh, actually not far. Yeah, just she the She wasn't far in it at all. She's got a long way to go. And I guess to put a little bit um, a little bit more information into that, it was something that um, she dreamed about for close to a decade. Yeah, really wanted um, to do it. You know, she was doing her uh, university study and everything and, and was- couldn't wait for the for the day when she could actually go and do it. So I guess the fact that she's not just quitting, because it, let's face it, something completely um, crazy, something that's, yeah. um, it, it's not like she got attacked by a bear, right? No. If you get attacked by a bear, you go, yeah, people get attacked by bears. That could happen again. Um, but that kind of situation, the time and the place and that somebody that unstable wandering around is not, uh, mm. you know, <laughs> you don't ever hear from, of that again, really. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you'd say bad luck, really unfortunate, terrible. Mm. Yeah. She's got to get back on the horse, man. And good luck. Good in luck. In a way for get her. Out there. But, uh, it's not, uh, I did debate whether to talk about that story at all. Because it's pretty graphic and, and violent. And the last thing I wanted to do, I thought about this, the last thing I wanted to do was deter, firstly, anybody from hiking, anybody from hiking alone. And secondly, 
more specifically, any women from, um, mm. you know, considering it because she did everything right. And this is not something that we say often on this podcast. Yeah, right. Uh, yep, yep. She specifically, um, from the restaurant, she specifically uh, teamed up with two other hikers and said, hey, let's stick together and let's get to the campsite and we'll set up our tents next to each other. So she's done so much right. Mm, yeah, sure. Uh, done everything right. And it's just super unfortunate that it came to that. Yeah, yeah, that could be discouraging. So let's hope that's not because no, it's not meant to be. It's definitely not this mm. this article, even the way it's written. It's and the what what she says throughout the article. This is not meant to be a, a don't hike story. It's meant to be a get out and do it. All right, I'll quickly bring this up, mate. Don't you worry about that. Let me bring this back. Okay. Let okay, me, come on. Because I can see you crying in your beer. <laughs> You're wrecking this Christmas party. <laughs> I'm ruining the staff Christmas party. <laughs> uh, this kid is 13 years old. His name is Stuart Moody. There's an Australian story too, so I'm bringing it back home, mate. Good, good. He has been relocating fish by hand from drying watering holes and putting them into a, a uh, nearby dam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, I did that see story? that. I did see that this week. Hey, what that's awesome. a legend looking there is there. What an absolute legend. So he yeah, basically, before and after school, he goes down, jumps in the water, and... His dog is the picture of his dog there following him around. Collects a fish. Collects a fish, takes him over to a better water source and and releases him. He's um how many did it say? He's basically done Yeah, he saved a hundred fish, but at the same time hundred native fish, but at the same time there's a thing called um carp. In Australia, which is is like a pet, it's kind of it looks a bit like a um, a goldfish sort of thing. Yeah, it's like a giant goldfish or a <laughs> a not so elegant. It's like a poor man's koi fish, and they released some idiots released them into river systems in Australia. And um, I've actually been to a river um, very close to there. In that, uh, that's that story came from Tenerfield in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been to a river very close to Tenerfield, and uh, there was carp. We just looked in, and we could see carp. Yeah. And so the rules are: if you catch a carp on a line or however, that you must absolutely must um, kill it, and and do not let it go back into the water system. And uh, definitely, is that, is that right? One hundred percent. It is illegal. To put it back. If you catch it, it is illegal to put it back. All states? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100% illegal to. So you must, uh, and there's ways. It's the same with um, tilapia and stuff. Um, and there's mm. a couple of other non-natives where if you catch one, uh, you must. I mean, normally they recommend that you double bag them and put them in, a, um, in the bin. Um, yeah, so there's no way because mm. obviously if you just threw them on the side, there might be, they might have eggs and, um, mm. yeah. So anyway, that fresh, so, water, fresh water fish, of course, fresh water fish we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. right. Um, so yeah, he removed 300, uh, invasive fish from, uh, from the area as mm. well at the same time. And there's a couple of cool little, uh, snippets of his, um, his story. He says he's been going down, as I said before, um, every day after, going down early and every day after school and catching the fish. So his neighbor taught him how to catch fish by hand. You know, mm. they, what is it, um, catfish ticklers or whatever? <laughs> yeah. They stick their fingers down and yeah. um, grab them. So he's, <laughs> uh, he's just been refining his technique and obviously he's doing a damn good job. He said one time he caught a 123 centimetre carp and it just knocked him over and he face planted in the water because he's small. He's a small kid. Um, 
And then he's speaking about the, uh, was it the catfish or the, what's the other one? It's the catfish at the that top, have the barbs. At the top there, and they do, yeah. Yeah, he hand catches the catfish. And uh, he said, every time I grab a catfish, I get spiked. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the cod, one grabbed hold of me and wouldn't let go. And I was just sitting there with a the cod on my hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh what I love about the um the story is just his well first of all is how hard and how hard he's working, how dedicated he is um spending his time doing it. But his dad is there's mentions in here, his dad's really proud of him and uh this um, fisheries biologist says, oh, it's, it's great that he's doing that. Oh, he'd be in heaven though. Seriously. That oh, kid, he'd be I mean, loving it. Be there's like nothing dream. more fun as a kid than Having catching. Fun. I used to go to the creek next to my house yeah. and catch um, crayfish and just to put them in our dam so that I could breed them up in our dam. Right, so we'd right, have yeah. them in our dam as well. Um, yeah, and that, that was good fun. But yeah, you're right. He just goes down there and it's pretty hot in that place as well yeah. um, during the day. So he scoot down He'd there. He'd be loving after. it, but he's making a difference. So that's good. Yeah, he is, he's, he's doing it. And I was just thinking how that's what it's all about. When I read this, I thought that's what it's all about. This kid is from his parents or his upbringing or the kind of immediate people around him. Mm -hmm. He understands the value of uh trying to save these native fish. Mm. So that's been programmed into him. He didn't just wake up one day and think of that. And it got me to thinking about how important it is to to educate kids, being that they're going to be the next generation, of the value of every kind of uh every kind of nature, whether it be the animals themselves or, or the plants or environments like uh, ocean environments or rainforests or even deserts. Uh, there's just, I think once they have an appreciation for that and once you've programmed them of the value of that, then they're going to go on and, and do kind of extraordinary things like this little kid. So mm. yeah, massive a good story. is a good story. Massive, massive props. Stuart Moody. You're a dead set legend. If you ever hear this or if anyone ever tips you off, mate, send me an email because you're a good kid. <laughs> good on you. I'd be damn proud of you if you're my son. Where are we going next, Craig? Have I got you worried? I think that might be, uh, yeah, that's pretty much that wrapped up. <clears throat> When's Santa coming? Is Santa going to turn up tonight? No, he's not. I, don't, I didn't organize that. I didn't realize this was our actual staff Christmas party. I just assumed. <laughs> you bought the beer. <laughs> uh, you know um, those Sherp vehicles? Do you know what a Sherp is? Yes. They're yeah. like a four-wheel, like, like but they, they're fully enclosed. Like a um, four-wheel drive trike, but they're fully enclosed. Is that what it is? No, it's, it's like a... Um, yeah, um, it's like a cube looking thing with massive wheels. Yeah. Uh I'm trying to think of what are those things that Alex runs around on? Oh no, no, they're way more advanced than that. You're trying to think of a Polaris. Like or, a Polaris or a Gator. With fully enclosed, no? Yeah, I'll just show you. Um anyway, I I just um saw on Facebook, I think it was this week, that Patriot campers are now the that's Australian how I, New Zealand stockists. That's, that's how I saw it. Yep, yep. I love their caravans. Oh, their camper vans, I should say. Yeah, yeah, I knew you did. I figured you probably would follow them on Facebook. Um, this thing, there's parts of this video, I'll put it on in the show notes. This is basically the Sherps. Uh, it's a Russian vehicle. So I honestly, this you asked me, and video. I... It's only this week, hey, but I haven't seen any of these videos. So what is it? What oh, is really? This so this thing's been around for ages. I remember seeing them a year or two ago. But just watch this. It's If it plays, 
because my computer's running a bit slow. Um, let's drop that down. So yeah, it's it's. I'll tell you the best way to describe it. And there's a very funny comment in the comment section on YouTube that's had engineers everywhere. Okay, we need to think about suspension, ground clearance, weight distribution, power distribution, and much more. And then it has none of that Russians put big wheel on a box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has oh, wow. something like a 60 centimeter, so a two foot clearance. Yeah. But the wheels are just ridiculously big. And where it gets real crazy is oh, it can drive over a meter. Like it, it can drive over obstacles a meter high. Right. Like this. Watch yeah. those steps. And uh, it can, um, you see it later on, like, oh, here it is here. <laughs> just drive straight over this enormous log in the forest. I'm just confused. Is that a lot bigger than a Polaris or not? Like, it looks bigger yeah, than a Polaris. Yeah, it, it is. It can, fit, s- um, it can fit eight people in. Because I know that with the Patriot crew, they like There's to take- a guy like, in there. They like to take little four, uh, four-wheel Polaris out a lot on the back of their trucks. Yeah. That's not going to fit on one of their trucks, is it? Oh, there's a cool trailer for it. What's surprising is this shot here now is it's on a sand bank on a very steep um, slope and it's coping. But where it gets crazy, Craig, is watch this. When they go into water. Oh, okay. It's like all terrain, like full. They float because of the yeah, massive yeah. tires. Yeah. And then the tread, like a- the tread becomes like a paddle, um, paddle boat, really. Jeez. 45 Ks an hour. This bit here is where it's going into the snow and I had my heart in my mouth. I remember seeing this original footage a while back and thinking, I was thinking, you crazy idiots. Uh, It it just makes me feel sick almost. This guy's driving across snow and an icy river and it's on such heavy angles. Look at this. These guys have driven across a lake wow, yeah. or into a lake. All of the ice has collapsed <clears throat> and they're just, um, they've just got pedal to the metal. Oh, that's got heaps of clearance. Yeah, yeah. Are they are they amphibious? Is that Look what you that. I was trying to think of that word before. It's so driving like, across a lake of ice. Gee whiz. Look at the wave. <laughs> that's Yeah, so they fully can just run, yep. drive through the water. It's scary. That's amazing. Scary. My initial thought when I saw it was, oh, wow, someone's come up with a clever idea because a lot of these, um, you know, four-wheel motorbikes, quad bikes are causing a lot of deaths and stuff. And, okay, so they're enclosing them now because that would protect the driver a lot more. No, this is... uh, But that's a whole next level, eh? It's a whole other game. Yeah. Seats eight people. What? Yeah. Look at this. Payloads a ton, so you can have a ton in it. Wow. And then as you're talking about, there's your trailer. <clears throat> See, they're not that big. Oh, yes, they are. That's big. <laughs> <laughs> Still absolutely insane. That's cool. Trust, yeah. trust the Russians to come up with something yeah. that crazy and epic. Oh, you knew I'd like that. Thanks, man. I did. I thought, well, what was it? <laughs> Even last episode, we uh, snuck in that news of the Cybertruck, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, this will fit. Okay, uh, I bring you now to Tom's Magical Mystery Media Mashup. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I've almost finished a book. Yeah. But I'm not going to talk about it until the new year when I've actually finished it. Uh, it's a fantastic book. We'll get there. We'll get back to books. Don't you worry about that. Mm-hmm. I like to bring you the weird and wonderful and the creepy. See if. You can hear this, Craig. This is a National Geographic uh, <clears throat> channel video. Do you want to run a line? Oh, yeah. I don't know. You'll have to reach. That's not going to reach. No, it's not going to reach. Let me see if you... You should be able to hear this. It's... Uh, the name of the video... The title of the video is Hear the Otherworldly Sounds of Skating on Thin Ice. 
Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you a little background before I get to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this small lake outside Stockholm, Sweden, emits otherworldly sounds as... Here's another one of those names. I always get those names. Um, why don't I just stick to articles from places where I can pronounce names? <laughs> um, Martin Ajni skates over its precariously thin black ice. Wild ice skating or Nordic skating is both an art and a science. A skater seeks out the thinnest, most pristine black ice possible, both for its smoothness and its high-pitched laser-like sounds. Uh, does it sound interesting? Yeah. You you know the sounds of lasers in Star Wars? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I remember seeing a documentary on how they made Star Wars, the film, and how they made the laser sounds. And the laser sounds were these guys would go out to power lines and, you know, the earth lines, so the big cable that gets bolted to the ground yeah, from the basically comes down from the top on an angle and gets bolted to the ground and it's big, thick cable. Mm -hmm. And they'd have a microphone and they'd hit um, those cables with a big spanner. Oh, okay. And that's the sound of a laser in Star Wars, or at least it used to be in the original films. True. Uh, this sounds very, very similar, almost exactly like that. Uh, <laughs> isn't it creepy? Yeah, turn your microphone. Yeah. Listen to this. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and uh, so that's coming from the skates, or am I no? It's the ice cracking. Oh, I get you. As he skates, which is freaky. Look at it. And then he stops in the video. He stops and smashes a hole. Look how thin it is. Oh, right. Damn. This guy's in the middle of a lake. Yeah. He measures it, and it's. Um, I think he says to the camera operator. 45 millimetres. Yeah. And the other guy goes, well, that's thick. Yeah. <laughs> 45 millimetres. Uh, he smashed it with his, he, he skates with these poles and I'm assuming that's a safety mechanism as well because he kind of has them, see he's holding them, they're really long. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. guess if you went through, you'd have that under your arms and you just fall onto that and it would span further than the hole you went through or one would hope. But <laughs> it's a little bit scary to watch, to crazy, be honest. Crazy bastard. But the sound is magnificent. Uh, well worth listening to. I don't know how good or bad that experience would have been for the <laughs> listeners just then. I'm a bit worried about Us that. Us just going, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. It's uh, an, audio, an audio medium, Tom, remember? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got to remember that. Speaking of audio mediums, nice segue back into sound. Mm. I don't know how this, I don't know how this uh, relates to hiking and outdoors. Perhaps because the guy is sitting in the outdoors as chickens and cats kind of casually cruise around him and I don't know what you call that instrument. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm going to guess, but do you want me to guess? I, I don't think it's a, well, the thing is I don't know because everything's written in another language. I don't know. And nobody in the comments has even mentioned it. it uh, first thing I thought was sitar, but it's not. No, it just sounds like a guitar. It's like a lute. Yeah, it looks like a lute. This guy is, how would you describe him? He's like got this whimsical long beard. Looks and like a wizard, mate. 
He's, he's like, like a, a wizard. wizard. Well, there's hilarious comments. The comments are absolutely hilarious. Welcome, traveler. Sit down and rest. I will play for you. <laughs> and someone says, why does he look like he's been there for a thousand years? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it is. Look, look, here's some loots. I think it's a loot. Yeah, it's it's much slimmer at the base and the neck's a lot longer. I'd say the neck's a third longer than so that too. a similar number of strings. Similar, but, yeah, yeah. might be different One, though. two, three, four, by the looks of it. And so when I was painting this picture, there's mountains in the background. There's obviously some shack off to the left and there's a seat. And behind him, it looks like a ring of rocks as in a fire pit. He's perched on this little wooden stool. There's a log over the right-hand side and a pile of rocks. There's a cat sitting on the log. The video goes for 14 minutes and at points, chickens wander around and the cat walks off. And <laughs> there's a hilarious, um, at around the 10 minute mark, you hear this gunshot in the distance. <laughs> Gunshots. Are pew, pew. And then this dog going, roo, 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 roo. and then this donkey just starts going crazy. Um, and he, he just plays through it. That's perfect. We, we should, um, listen to this guy. I'll just put it on to another bit because he actually sings as well. Truly. Oh, it sounds great. Chickens are just cruising around him. That's awesome. It's so good. Man, he is an absolute artist. That's great. Really cool. I just realized that a lute is actually any plucked string instrument with a neck. So that's... Oh, right. Could be... <laughs> a, a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel so um, clever for calling it a lute now because basically anything falls into that category. But yeah, that's a pretty cool instrument, hey? Yeah, and he, he just, I don't know, he's captivating. Really cool. Uh, I haven't listened to the whole thing. I only listened to a few minutes of it, but I do want to get some time and and listen to it in its entirety because it's very mystical. Yeah. All right. Well, if we're talking about um media. Yeah. I um, watched a few episodes of Alone, so thank you. He's oh, very good. For putting me onto that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I thought I might have mentioned it years ago, but um, anyway, regardless, well, I'm glad you got onto it now. I'm kind of ashamed or embarrassed that I hadn't been onto it, mate. It's, um, I don't have Foxtel, so mate, therefore... You, there's plenty of other things you should be embarrassed about, <laughs> but not that. Okay, take that one off the list. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, of of the many things I'm embarrassed about. Yeah, no, it was really good. It is good, isn't it? Yeah, it is good. It's I, well put together too. I'll go back to my initial concerns. I don't think it's it's entirely fair that some of them get dropped in different locations. But this is just the first episode. That that sorry, first series. That first series is in a pretty brutal place. Are they all? You know how? Oh, it's all brutal. That's Vancouver Island, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they do Vancouver Island twice, and then they go to it's Patagonia. Tough. Patagonia is horrific, and then it, it gets even worse than that. They end up in. Uh, Oh, I can't remember the one I just watched. I just finished the last season. I can't remember where that one was. Oh, one of them, they, they're in um, uh, China, I think. Yeah, right. But yeah, it's it's brutal, always brutal. <laughs> and you can tell that they time it so that uh, it's a month or so or six to eight weeks before winter every time. So they give you a couple of weeks to get established and everyone thinks they're doing pretty well. And then winter rolls mm. in, 
fish stop biting, animals hibernate, gets freezing cold, and people start tapping out you know, real quick in those conditions. Oh, sure. Which is understandable. I'm I'm totally surprised that they actually get any real footage that's usable. What's what do you think the incentive and the motivation is for these um people to use the camera? Like how do you reckon the producers well, get them? They do train them. So there's a they do go through an extensive training course in all of the cameras and obviously part of their contract is this only works if you're filming it yeah. or else there's no, you're not going to be in the show. Yeah. And uh, I think, well, I think quite simply it's people are doing the filming so that, uh, you know, hopefully they can use this as a platform to, to leverage their own, uh, you know, their own media or to leverage their own career. And it certainly happened on multiple multiple occasions like so many of those people even ones that didn't get very far uh mm. ones that did get far and everything in between have all launched their own kind of uh survival courses or classes or retreats or youtube channels or documentary style stuff yeah yeah yep. so tons of people have gone on to yeah, I to spotted, foster their own stuff. I spotted Joe Robinek, who I <clears throat> think's a bit of a legend on YouTube, and he was on there in the first uh, series. I was, was blown away by that. Um, yeah, that's funny because you knew about Joe yeah. not from that. Yeah, not and from that. And then after you watched it, you texted me and said, oh, Joe's in it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, first thing I said to you tonight was, oh, yeah, wasn't Joe the guy who lost his um, fire steel? Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> and had to tap out because he couldn't make. Yeah, fire. yeah, yeah. No. Uh, I think from what he said, he knocked it. He might have knocked it into the fire, didn't he? I dropped it on the beach somewhere. <laughs> dropped it on the beach. Oh, it must have been another episode. Someone else in another series that would that had would it beside, and I think they knocked it into the fire, so it just would have completely melted. Yeah, that would hurt. But yeah, I, I no, yeah. I over I overthought it a bit when I saw them um, putting these people out there, and you've got you've got a lot of work to do when you arrive out there and you and I know it's hard to, to, to pick up a camera and set up tripods and do all that. And yeah, I, I know they don't pay these people. They get a prize. They get 500 K if they win. Do you reckon though that they got some incentives to, no. to, to get some good I'd, footage? I wouldn't think so. No. Um, if your footage makes it in the show, you get some. Well, Maybe the, the, what made it easier, and I'm not saying it is easier. I mean that hike I did recently, I self filmed, which I haven't done for a long time, and it's tedious and it's hard. And the hardest time to film is probably the time you should be filming because you're going to capture the best emotion and everything. You know, when when the shit hits the fan, totally. Is when you want to be filming, not not. I don't feel like filming because I'm sick and throwing up and I don't feel well. Well, guess what? That makes good TV. <laughs> so, totally. Uh, well, I think what makes it easier, and I'm, as I said, I'm certainly not saying it's easy. What, what makes it easier is they have cameras that are more like handy cams sort of things that, you know, self-focus and all that sort of stuff. So they're not setting up um, cameras like, no. Like we do, and spending time, um, no. adjusting the focus and doing all of the exposure and stuff, exposure and checks and balances that we do, hmm. um, the, the ISO and everything. I, I I doubt very much that they're getting deep into that. They're just told, yeah, it's on the right settings, hmm. go nuts, hmm. and so they, and you'll see often that sometimes they'll have up to three cameras running, yeah, uh, around them, and. They get, uh, I know that there's from one of the seasons, it might've been a behind the scenes episode or something. They have, um, I think it's every four days or something like that. They have to go and change the batteries put and the batteries. They must walk down the beach or something and put them in a, a case down there and yeah, yeah. basically then go back to camp and they don't see or communicate with anybody, but they just kind of cruise in swap the batteries and the SD cards and stuff and then cruise out and then they go check it the next day and they got fresh batteries and off they trot. 
Mm. Anyway, my first impression <clears throat> is it's a fantastic show. Recommend it. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it because it's really inspiring. And I'm just really curious to, to look at the magic of how they made it because um, the bit of the behind the scenes stuff must have been really interesting as well. Um, but certainly, man, they, they they dropped them off in places with, you know, some pretty wild animals and... Well, oh, it's the oh, real deal. It's you know, deal. you know, it wouldn't take much to scare, scare the crap out of me, but um, <laughs> I would have been scheduleless for sure. There's, there's a that somebody could get killed, and I'm not, I'm not even joking about that. Yeah, somebody I, could get killed. I was watching it with my little boy, and he's like freaking out about the bear. And I said, but you know, the bear would be well fed. There's heaps of fish there. You know, the bear wouldn't be starving. <laughs> <laughs> That was the only way I could calm him down from being scared himself. So yeah, yeah, because they got unfortunately pretty... the bears aren't always after um, food. You know they're, too, they're curious and uh, yeah, they were coming close. Eh? Just saw what's that and come and check it out. And if you spook them or accidentally stumble across them, uh, things go south pretty quickly. Yeah, no, we we don't have to worry about bears. We have had no experience with them, but that's that only did. of the koala kind. Koala bears, which are. Marsupials, aren't they? So they're not even real bears. Yeah, it did scare me. Uh, what, a, a koala? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, I, I remember uh, as a kid, I was, uh, I'd always be running around in the, in the bush after school because uh, we lived on acreage and all around us was other acreage and not much of it was developed. So I'd go over our border and then run through you know, the swamp and down the creek and all sorts of stuff. And I remember one day I was I was cruising through the uh, bush and I turned, I came around this tree and there was this tiny baby koala on the ground. Oh, yeah. And just out in the middle of this little clearing and it was absolutely gorgeous. And my first thoughts as a kid, whenever I'd find birds that had fallen out of nests or whatever, if I couldn't get them back to where they should be, um, I'd take them home and we'd look after them and then re-release them again. Uh, or anything that was injured, we'd at least try and save stuff. Mm. So my first thoughts went to, oh no, you, your mum's been hit by a car or something and I might have to take my shirt off and kind of grab you and take you home. And so I was still just standing watching it and just going through my options. And then I took another step towards it and off to my left, I just heard this kind of death growl from hell, just go. Yeah, and I looked yeah. to my left and the mum was there waiting at the base of a tree. Like she'd started to climb. And then it was obviously what had happened is it was walking across this clearing to get to her, to follow her up a tree and I've just come bursting in on the scene and I've looked to the right and I've only seen the little baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, when I heard that blood curdling growl <laughs> and I looked to the left and she was big mama, she was big. I saw the claws and everything. I just went, oh, we're all good here. <laughs> Believe me, we are all good here. And I just took a few steps back slowly. And uh, as soon as I gave him some space, the little fellow, who I think was probably just never seen a human before because he or she just stopped and was looking at me with no fear, basically just, oh, wow, what's this thing in my way? Hmm. Uh, as soon as I took some steps back, it it crawled over to the mom and then they both went up the tree together, uh, which was a yeah, fantastic experience. But they are definitely not to be played with. <laughs> The wild ones. No, vicious. Vicious little bit. So bit. many stories of them tearing things up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> uh, Craig, what, what do you think about um, a hike that <clears throat> would take three years to complete? What do you think about that? Do you have three <laughs> years spare? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Book it in. Um, the problem is that's based on walking 20 kilometers every single day. Really? So yeah, half marathon a day, um, which is impossible. I mean, you can't sustain that (laughs) 
for three weeks, let alone three years. Uh, so what this guy's done is he's calculated the longest walkable distance on Earth. And it starts down at, what's the southernmost point of Africa? Is that Cape Town? Yeah, it's Cape Town. Yeah. It starts at Cape Town, goes all the way up, sneaks across the little gap where Africa joins the larger continent there, and then goes across all those uh, countries, and then eventually you end up in Russia and you go right across to the tip without crossing any water sources, uh, so no ferries, no nothing. Like you could actually walk. And uh, to this, he's made a, like a mini documentary on it. And to his knowledge, no human has ever completed it. Um, for obvious reasons, I mean, to start with, someone has to give up. Where do you come up with these things? <laughs> Where do you find these things? <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Through Africa. That's my Jeez. only job. My only job is to uh <laughs> is to delight <laughs> is to delight you. I don't want to I'm not gonna do that. You're not gonna do this one? Oh, you're so soft. Uh anyway, you'd need three years minimum. I'd say you'd probably need five to six years because there's no way um well you'd probably need ten years because at some point you're gonna be um in a prison somewhere for a while. <laughs> um it's a total of um 14,334 miles. It's, um, for the time you've done it, there's been 123,000 meters or 76 miles elevation change over that three years, <laughs> which is like climbing Everest 14 times. Uh, now, here's where it gets really, really crazy. You have to walk through some pretty dodgy stuff. Yeah, I bet. I'll rattle off a few uh, a few countries. Tigers. Um, Zimbabwe. Yeah. Okay. A little bit dangerous with the people, pretty dangerous with uh, animals too. Then you get up through Uganda, highest malaria rate in the entire world. Then you eventually you'll end up in South Sudan, third most dangerous country in the world. Then you have to cross the Sudanese desert. Um, then after you've done that, that's okay, because you've just got to walk across the Sahara Desert. Yeah, yeah. And there's no roads. And there's no, basically there's no, um, there's nothing. Uh, then you're going to end up in um, Syria, which takes the title of the second most dangerous country in the world. And eventually you'll end up in Siberia. Now, you're going to be in Russia for so long. You'll be walking for so long that no matter how you timed it, you would not be able to avoid a winter. Do you get what I mean? <laughs> so at minimum, you'd be walking through Russia for a year. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, you're going to hit winter, which is minus 39 degrees Celsius uh, on a good day. Geez. That's without wind chill or anything. Uh, no. So at some point you're going to be walking through that, which again goes back to my earlier point where you're not going to cover 20 kilometers on a minus 39 degrees day in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't uh, kind of uh, turn you off, there's one particular um, section called the Road of Bones that you'll be walking along. And uh, I think they um, enslaved these people to build it. Um, well, basically, they were held against their will to build this road. And as they die, they just get mixed in with the, um, with the road base. Nice. And so you're literally walking across. Perfect. Yeah, so... I don't know, 2020. Yeah, you're bringing New this up. New Year's resolution. While we're discussing <laughs> plans for 2020. Just putting it out there. Awesome. For anybody who's not going to get that uh, Antarctica job, maybe you want to be the first human ever to walk the longest that's, distance on Earth. That's the challenge. There you go. Um, three years minimum. 
just keep that in mind before yes. you go ahead. Like I said, it'd be at least six because you're going to get smashed in winter and <sighs> probably lose all your gear six, time from, six times from people mugging you and whatnot. It's another one of those discouraging stories, mate. Oh, no, no. that's crazy because I'm ending on that. <laughs> uh, no, no, someone will, want, someone will do it. Someone will prove us wrong, hey? I hope so. <clears throat> Um, is there some, is is that a story about someone who's actually going to do it or something? No, who's no, just no. It's a guy. That, it's a guy who's just basically done all the research together. and said, "Yeah, right. This is the longest, longest walk on earth." And he's not just to be clear. It's not zigzagging. Like it's pretty much a straight path yeah. up. Um, you know, it it avoids. Uh, as but, I said, it avoids crossing lakes yeah. and rivers. So there are bits where it has to do little loops and stuff to get around wow, areas. But crazy idea. Yeah, yeah. Someone will do that one day. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime, though. Okay. Uh, heading into shout-outs slash feedback now. Craig, I've been called out, mate, in a big way. No. Yeah, via email. Totally hard to believe. Yeah. Is it? Are you being sarcastic? No, I'm not going to hold my judgment. What is it about? Oh, <clears throat> I always say stupid things on the podcast. Uh, now, Ginger is from Kentucky and her climbing crag, her local, is a Red River Gorge. She says... Um, Awesome hiking, incredible arches. You'll have to Google it. And I did. And she's right. It's a pretty spectacular um, area. It reminded me a little bit. Funnily enough, I expected it to be a lot. Um, I was thinking more sort of desert sort of cliffs and stuff. But it was a lot like when we were at the steamers. Just those big rock faces with yeah. a fair bit of vegetation. Okay. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. She says... I've really enjoyed your podcast. I'm thinking, oh, this is going well, isn't it? That's good, good. Great. Good. But I have to make a comment about the most recent one. You were all talking about etiquette on the trail when trail running. So I'm going to blame this one on you. You got me into this trouble, Craig. Oh, I was wondering what might happen about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. All good. All good. Until you mention that if you were passing a 60-year-old grandma with her grandkids, you might slow down and have a talk and then move on. Okay, so I don't think you meant this as condescending, but as a 64-year-old grandma <laughs> who rock climbs, mountain climbs, oh, hikes wow. <laughs> and swims, uh, I'd like to say, if you pass me in brackets, if, if. just let me know what side you are on. <laughs> Go hard, yeah. Totally fries me. Uh, then she's, um, she attached some, uh, photographs as well. So I'm attaching pictures of this grandma that climbed, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. A con, a con Kagua, Mount Blanc and many others over the past five years. Uh, if you were, then <laughs> she really twists the knife. If you're in the U S and want to join me and my other in uh, inverted commas, 60-year-old grandma and grandpa friends. We'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, really, though, except for the grandma comment, I love the podcast. Uh, I, I wrote back very politely with my <laughs> with my tail between my legs saying... Uh, I hope you did, mate. I did. Of course I did. And I said, um, I guess I was talking about the typical kind of uh, person around that age demographic who maybe net doesn't get off the couch and uh i was thankful to get a reply that said all is forgiven <laughs> and you earned extra bonus points with me a while ago on a podcast that when you reviewed between a rock and a hard place remember that yeah you gave that a hard rap i did 
I did. And she says, someone gave me that book. I hope they're not listening. Uh, thinking I would love it. I hated it. I could not even finish it. I was so glad to hear I wasn't the only one. Oh, wow. How's that? How's that for being honest? That's good. I could have said, oh, it's a fantastic book about an inner journey <laughs> of a guy in trouble, but I didn't. I said, he made so many stupid mistakes and he, and he just, the whole time he was talking like he was some kind of a legend or something. Right. Ginger calls it as she sees it. She calls it straight, mate. That's good. Now, here's here's where that, th- this is what I love. This is what I love about hearing from people from around the world is these little insights. You'll like this, Craig. Listen to this little story she gave me. Um, I guess it, she was kind of responding to a, a part of my email where I was talking about um, people not being active enough. Mm-hmm. It really is too bad that more do not stay active as they get older. I remember years ago when my kids were very young and I took them to an, to ice skating every week in the winter. There was an older gentleman, doesn't seem so old now, he was 72, and he was skating every single week. One day he stopped to help my son with his laces and I skated over to thank him. He was a widowed... Uh, he, yeah, he was widowed, and his late wife was a former figure skater, he told me. Then he asked me if I knew why he still skated every weekend. He said because if he stopped, he would never be able to start again. Hmm. That's heavy. That is a bit heavy. That's full on, eh? That's yeah. something to kind of... Uh, um. I read that bit and then I read it again and wrote it again and thought, that is profound. That one, I just love, it's just like something out of a movie as well. I just love thinking about this old guy who, you know, they have this interaction. She said, oh, thanks for helping my kid with their laces. And um, and then he just kind of turns around and says, do you know why I skate every weekend? <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's something out of a movie. Yeah, true. Um, but you can imagine that to be true. And then, no, a hundred percent. It that's why it resonated so heavily with me. I thought, well, yeah, if you stop, uh, it takes stop a lot doing it, it takes a lot to get longer. back. Yes, it does. And what you'll normally find is, uh, and I'm talking about anything and I'm talking about anyone of any age is you're more prone to injury. Um, if you stop and then start again, because you'll tend to go back at a pace that you think you can do. And overdo it a bit. Uh, I did it. I tore my Achilles tendon um, years and years ago by doing exactly that, having a break from martial arts, and then going back to my first session after about two years, going hell for leather and um, overtraining, tore my Achilles tendon. It's never been the same. So you know, imagine adding a lot of years to that, and then and then hmm. stopping something. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Ginger. Thanks for giving me a rev up. Thanks for giving me a little scare. And uh, Good on you, Ginger. And thanks for that insight. Yeah, Craig's applauding you for... <laughs> on for many levels. Go at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had a few couple of tweets. I don't check Twitter enough, and I, I do apologize to people who communicate and share our stuff through there much appreciated uh there's a couple that i've missed over the last month or two um dino anthony scala says he loves the show and he's all caught up now and that was um and he says look up my state sometime he's in new hampshire and he says home of the white mountains and i thought that just sounds like an epic place. So I did Google it. The White Mountains are a mountain range covering about a quarter of the state of New Hampshire and a small portion of Western Maine in the United States. Uh, they're part of the Northern Appalachian Mountains and the most rugged mountains in New England. And look at the um, sort of terrain, Craig. It's absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Isn't it? Oh, man. Yeah, that looks good. It looks epic, le- legit. Yeah, that's the real deal. Yeah. So, mate, thank you. I did. I did look it up. It looks fantastic. Thanks, Dino. Wow. Um, Darren Diaz, 
he tweeted us a while back now, and I, as I said, I do apologize. He really liked the uh, episode with we did with Richard Matthews, yep. the adventurer from the UK. So thanks, mate. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Joe, our good friend Joe Aker, he um, said that he's been watching uh, videos on YouTube. He loves seeing our part of the world and listening to our adventures as they unfold. Keep up the great work and wishes us many, many more safe travels, which is all we could possibly ask for. Yeah. Appreciate that. He was also the uh, recipient of one of the hats when I sent out a whole bunch of Caribbean hats. Oh, yeah. He yeah. says, oh, and I absolutely love my new hat. Oh. Thanks again. <laughs> Where do you reckon? Where's Joe from? Where do you reckon? Uh, oh, I should know that because I had his address. That's uh, all right. He's, he's. That's okay. US. I'm sure he's US. Based. Okay. Can't remember exactly. No worries. Um, but yeah, always, you know, always a great supporter as well. Yeah. yeah I remember his name. Uh, in episode 20, I did a little shout out to a guy who commented on my, I'm pretty sure it was the trial running video. Have you watched that yet, Craig? Yes, mate. I told you last time. Oh, did you? Good. I can't remember. I just see see red whenever anyone talks to me about that video now. (laughs) Oh, what? what, The one that my mate didn't even watch? Didn't care about. (laughs) Uh, It's good. It's good. Yeah, I'm sure it was that that he commented on. And and he was the one that... uh, I couldn't pronounce his name and I said, I don't even know if that's his real name because people just make up names on YouTube. And he said, P.S., um, thanks for the shout out. And yes, that is my real name. Wow. And he says, think about a cheap Korean car and you'll get close to the right pronunciation. Uh, he's talking about Kia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then when I look at his name again, after knowing that, I went, oh, yeah, it's K-E-I-R. So it's probably more like Kia, Kia so with a more pronounced R. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to call him Kia, and I do appreciate He sent us an email, mate, because he was listening to the last episode when we were talking about uh, friction fire and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And you asked a question about you wondered what types of wood could yep. be found in Queensland. Yep. Again, just like the email from Ginger, this is just fantastic that people are uh, – you know, getting back to us and educating us as well as everybody help listening. It, help us out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He says, I'm no expert, but I've had success at the bow drill using using both coastal hibiscus. He's even put, um, we need our mate Josh onto this, mate. He's even put the botanical name hibiscus tiliaceus, tiliaceus, something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, and believe it or not, the ever-present Lantana. scourge that is lantana. lantana. Yeah, I bet. Uh, now- So the lantana is used for the drill. Well, no, here's the thing is um, that I did mention on that podcast that most people will use a harder wood for a- Base. Base and then a softer wood for the spindle. But that's not oh, true. Oh, no, it might be the other way around. I, I think I it's the other way around. Wrong. Yeah, the, the spindle's hard, but the base- is what is what you churn up to make the ember. I think it's the other way around. This is why it's confusing for me. Isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, or because I just tell you the wrong things. So that's why it's confusing. Anyway, he says that with both of these plants, it's possible to make the spindle and the baseboard from the same material. Oh, okay. No need for two different types, a hardness of wood. Oh, that's that's what I was needing to know, and oh, mm, that's good. So you can just get some lantana, uh, a, a big... Well, yeah. I, I mean, I don't think that's the case with um, all the uh, methods around the world. But it, the fact that um, Kia has, has obviously tried this himself and said he, he's had success with yeah. using the same material in the base and the spindle, then um, that's really good to know. That's pretty interesting too. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, also good to know, like, lantana is a horrific... Invasive weed um, over here in Australia. Yeah. And it's got to be completely dead. It's got to be not green. You can find at all. Even on a big lantana bush, you'll find parts that are dead. uh, I know. Whilst the rest of it looks 
perfectly green. Hanging off it. But then you'll need a big trunk for the base, potentially. Yeah, you'll definitely need a mm. thicker bit to split in half mm. to give you your And you've got to notch board. out and yep. just, yeah. I've seen how to do it. I just never have mastered oh, it. I've so never, You've never mastered it. You've never tried it. Never tried it. <laughs> it's going to be hard to master. <laughs> no, I've, ne I've never tried it either. Uh but I'll get I, to it one day. I got let's a lot do of it. things on my list. Yeah, we should muck around next time. Let's do it. Um, because we often do go past Lantana. Yeah, I I know, I've seen coastal hibiscus. I just can't remember what it looks like. I'd have to Google just it. Just not what there's this fire ban on at the moment. No, we won't be <laughs> rubbing any sticks together at all. Most of our um, most of our friends on here will be having a nice. You know, oh, white people are probably winter. Uh, yeah, people um, are probably sipping some. I don't know what do people sip in warm, snow? Cognac, not a cold beer. They'll be drinking something, something warm. Yeah, um, sipping away with the fireplace on, and uh, and we're sweltering. You know, the snowshoes hung up mm -hmm. on the wall mm -hmm. of the cabin. That sounds good, actually. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Eh? <laughs> and their um, their chocolate Labrador kind of sleeping at their feet. True. That's that sounds good. That sounds almost as good as um, ba bathing under the stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a fire inside over here. We're not allowed to. No, not at the moment. Um, thanks, Kia. Really appreciate that that information and insight, mate. It's good to hear from you. Thanks for for your support. Hey, I've got some um, I got some giveaway news. It's been a long time. Been a long time. That? Actually, it hasn't been that long uh, since we've given anything away. Right. Eh? Uh, I'm not going to start the giveaway on this podcast because for several reasons, I'm a little unorganized. Craig and I haven't had time to discuss exactly how people would go into the running for this prize. Uh, and also I felt like dropping an episode this late in the year, uh, you know, people are kind of could be away on holidays. Hopefully you're all out hiking and you don't have phone reception of any kind and you wouldn't be able to uh to get on to it yeah exactly so I, I just wanted to make it um something that we attack uh very early in the new year mm -hmm. but our fantastic sponsor topo maps plus oh yeah um i was talking to them recently and they want to give two two lucky people uh the complete pro subscriptions and full uh, map pass subscription. That's awesome. Yeah, that's massive. So that gets you into that app and gives you full functionality plus a ton of um, crazy High definition. different maps. maps yeah, yeah. yeah. So if that whets your appetite, then definitely stay tuned early in the new year once we work out exactly how we're going to um, pursue this cool. or, or rather get you guys to pursue it. We'll let you know. So, yeah, just a bit of a teaser there. Sorry about that, but you can't have it yet. <laughs> That's not really fair, man. Come on, Isn't surely, it? surely. Especially being Christmas and all. <sighs> no, nah, we'll, we'll work that out. That sounds good. Nah, I, th I, I couldn't hold uh, hold back any longer. That's exciting. So at least put the news out that it's going to come. All right, tune in. All right, mate. Let's um, let's start. Uh, I was going to say wrapping this baby up, but we're not wrapping this baby up yet. <laughs> let me tell you, we're celebrating. <laughs> uh, we are celebrating. We're still celebrating. But what I was going to do was um, just take a a little walk back down memory lane. <laughs> okay. Of what a fantastic year it's been for the uh, for the podcast. Have you had fun? Yeah. Yeah, man. I was what? thinking on the way here tonight how much, how enjoyable, how enjoyable it is. It has been fun. Yeah, you know, we've had some massive, massive laughs and some of the best conversations with some of the most interesting people I've yeah. ever spoken to. No offense to you, mate, <laughs> but um, these people were so interesting. So much <laughs> more interesting than your usual oh, chats with me, right? Oh, I just remember just because just I was roasting you for a second there i just remembered uh i uh -huh. jumped out of um i jumped out of shout outs a bit too quickly because um 
our old mate Jodes. He's always there ready to throw a bit of oil on, in the pan and fry you up, mate. Oh, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. He said, we were talking about running. I can't remember exactly the, oh, I was talking about trail running and I um, said that I overtook two horses and he said something about me being mad. Um, but he said, I'm sure Quaid, Craig can run quite fast, even with a whiskey in hand. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. Yep. He, um, he really enjoyed it. Jodes, uh, is, uh, he subscribed to our podcast on Podbean, which is really cool because any, he, he comments directly on the episodes there, which is great. So consider that guys. It's a really good, very stable app with um tons of other great podcasts almost as good as ours on there as well yeah um he also liked the idea of us doing a q a type of thing which we did put out there we're thinking about doing that in uh in in the near future obviously 2020 now um now here's what remember i said that he gets around and he's has dog with him. Mm. And I said, Oh, I assume it's his dog, but maybe it's not his dog. And I was kind of half joking, but he has confirmed that, um, it's, <laughs> it's funny the way you put it. It's not my official dog, <laughs> right? but I'm so glad to hear that he did ask the owners if he can walk him, uh, and give him mm -hmm. that freedom that, that dogs need. Uh, so they agreed. So at least three to four days out of a month, uh, we go on long trails and have random adventures together as man and dog bounding across the countryside and coastal paths, enjoying nature and ice creams along the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Jodes. Yes, um, whiskey is a fairly large part of my training regime. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's been part working. of his trail food as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's been working for me so far. And it's certainly, you know, that's the thing. You can't argue with that. Nobody can sit here and argue with that. <laughs> it works for you. You got what? Three, three malt sandwiches tonight. Yeah. yeah. And uh, whiskey on the trail. That's well, it, that's a good name for, uh, it's a good name for a band or something. Look, Wh I know I come whiskey here. Whiskey on the trail. And I take the top off a few and it, I line them up. <laughs> it's it's because I never know if you might be gonna you know have a have a marathon here you know, you know what I'm saying. Well, that's it. It's always a marathon. I'm yeah. surprised. You, have you finished you? Yeah, I'm getting there. Oh, he's on his third. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it it'd be really bad if I created some drinking game around. You have <laughs> to skull every time Tom gets something wrong. <laughs> You'd be smashing through, I'm gonna have to through go, a whole carton. Go back to the fridge. Yep. All right, let, let me, uh, which order will I do it in? I'll go back from most recent back back through to, to the start of the year. I think I'll do it that way. So obviously, uh, last episode, fantastic. We got to speak with uh, Claire Dunn. I think we can all agree that was a hugely insightful um, chat with her. Uh, then we we did oh we did the hiking news episode. We spoke with Tom from the Scottish Highlands the episode before that. Awesome. We did. We've had so many guests this year. Uh, we did um, well double episode with Andy. Soz, I can't remember. Soloshi. Solo that's right. Soloshi. Andy Soloshi. Two parts there. Um. We had Richard Matthews on, who we talked about earlier. And then I've forgotten about some of these. I forgot that we did uh, In the Back Cave. Yeah. And that's where we introduced our buddy, Josh. Well, that was one of my favorites of the year, man. That's one of my highlights. Do you mean the uh, episode itself or or the trip or the trip. all of it? The trip. I mean, that- The trip was great. <laughs> that episode was hard work. There was- that's the first time you've hiked with Josh, wasn't it? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's right. Because I'd done two with him and then had him, uh, he's, but you met him up at my place, didn't you, uh, when I had that yeah, cook up? Um, yes, yeah. yeah but yeah. I'd, I'd met him earlier at, um, remember we met him at the at the falls that oh, time? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, since that time, you met him at my place once and then, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, but I hadn't yeah, hiked with him. It was good. Either. It was so good to finally get 
get both of you guys out on the trail. Uh, it, it was good fun. I was talking to my one of my sons yesterday about tiny bats because we saw one flying around the yard and I sort of remembered the cave. No, but just my highlights for the year, totally. Um, that challenging experience, we yeah went the long way to the campsite and... Don't forget, <laughs> that made you smarter, remember? <laughs> made you smarter. No, just it's... like that uh, Red Bull uh, news article said. Oh, yeah. Navigating and getting lost yep. improves your brain. Exercises your brain. Yep. Uh, oh, before that was the adventure in Tasmania. Had a lot of people write in and say how much they enjoyed listening to us cruising around and uh, basically spelling out the, the story as we went. Yeah, good. Uh, we had Kaz and Chrissy from A Wild Land before yep. that. And before that, the controversial What's in the Pack episode, which i got to say that was, I don't know what it was. I might have been tired, and, I, and I've got to apologize for that too. I talk slow enough as it is, uh, but I was listening back to a podcast recently and because I, I do have to listen back to them to put in all of the uh, stuff into the show notes and make sure I get everything that we mention, and I just sounded so tired and slow, and I thought, oh, geez, I hope I'm not like that all the time because that would be irritating. Mm. But I think to the uh, to the normal person, I probably sound like I'm tired and slow all the time. Mm-hmm. We could probably get through all this in under an hour, but um, probably do it in about fifteen minutes. minutes, I reckon. But you do talk fairly slowly. I do talk slow. Yeah. I have there's space to breathe. Let's, let's put it that way. It's perfect, mate. It matches my slow thinking, so that's good. <laughs> it gives you time to drink. <laughs> uh, yeah, what's in the pack? That was a tough one to do. I felt like. Uh, Oh, I think I was tired and struggling with that one. But again, the the feedback on that, a lot of people love that, how much detail we went into. And and I guess, I guess I'm taking it out of context because if you're driving on a long trip, and that's definitely, I had at least two people say that they whacked that on on a long car trip and listen to the whole thing. I guess if you drive along, it, it would have felt more conversational. So, hmm. Yeah, good. I, I mean, I'm glad people enjoyed it. And we kicked the year off. We kicked off 2019's first podcast with Swedish outdoorsman Thomas Evung. Um, oh, perfect. Brilliant. Such a, that was such a kick-ass episode. Yeah. I loved that one. So yeah, that's what, that's what we've, um, that's what we've done, mate. That's something to be pretty proud of. Hmm. What's, uh. I mean, are you saying that um, the steamers was a bit of a highlight for you this year? Yeah. Obviously, um, it'd be pretty easy to guess that Tasmania was as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Tasmania was great. Getting that um, experience in Tassie and the summit of Osso. And to be honest, um, using the Grail in its first, for me, a first long trip using that thing, I just loved it, man. I had a got a lot out of that. I had a great time down there. But as far as far as like a really rewarding experience was yep. that steam is I got so much out of that. Oh, really? Just physically and mentally and the whole the fact that talking about um filtering water, we didn't we had to ration our water and you know, we had to Yeah, that was a bit um uh, serious, to, yeah. Had to had to approach that carefully. I thought it was um yeah, the highlight. Yeah, it put us in a different it took us out of that kind of comfortable space where, oh, yeah, we're, we're camped right next to a creek. We know where everything is. We've got unlimited water. We can have coffees and cook our hydrated meals, and we yeah. don't have a stress in the world. But it was quite the opposite. There was a fairly – well, we got lost on the way. I mean, we've, I'm not going to go over it in detail again, but we got lost. Then we couldn't find the campsite. Then we end up sleeping in a cave doing a podcast. I mean – <laughs> That's a pretty good way to round out yeah. a bad trip. <laughs> yeah. But as you we often say, those those challenges made for just a really awesome memory that I'll hold really close and dear that one. Yeah. Um and there's I mean, I've always felt like you have to hike with people who 
have got you back. And I mean, you know, really got you back if, if mm. things go bad, you get injured or whatever. And that's obviously I put a, a enormous amount of trust in, in you and, and vice versa. And we've got that understanding. Mm. Uh, but it, I've, as I said, I've hiked with, uh, Josh on, on two, um, was it two? I'm confusing myself now. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. Anyway, I've hiked with him before and I knew instantly that, uh, he's someone that you can depend on. Yeah. And, uh, to, to have you kind of, both of you guys on that, I thought, well, there's no, there's not going to be any dramas because I got the two, you know, toughest kind of mentally strong and, and capable guys with me. We'll get through it if we just, uh, yeah, work it all out. Yeah. No, it's quite unique, man. I loved it. Yeah, it was a good trip. And, and, uh, when it comes to, you know, talking about planning next year and, you know, some of the things we might do, I do often think about revisiting stuff that, I mean, in a sense, you could say that was a failed trip, um, largely because of navigation. Uh, I'll take that one on the chin and then just the, the pure lack of water put us in, in a dangerous place, add the heat to that. And I think that that's somewhere that you might want to hit in the, in the middle of winter when mm. you're not expending as much, uh, water through sweat and everything. Mm. So yeah, I wouldn't mind, uh, seriously considering Oh, I'll go back there one getting day. Getting that one back. There's also a plane wreck over on the other ridge. Yes, yeah. Which I'm real keen to go and uh, go and check out. Because I've got some pretty solid um, GPS coordinates for that. But yep. it's pretty rough. So, yeah, there's something to think about anyway. But, yeah, it's, uh, I almost forgot about the steamers. That was good times. You know, it was just good sitting in a cave having a yak. Totally. Um. I know this is a kind of a, and I and I wasn't going to really go there because I don't think it's right to say that one guest is more interesting than another or better than another or whatever because every single guest, I've enjoyed the conversation immensely, if you can't tell mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, but there's definitely a couple of standouts and... Um, do you have any that really stood out with you, Craig? You don't have to say anything, mate. I'm not trying to um, put you on the spot. You can just say, no, Tom, I found them equally fascinating. <laughs> All equally <laughs> they were well. Exactly thanks. equally the same. For but me, that's hard. That's hard. I know it is hard. And I don't, and it, as I said, it's absolutely no disrespect to, to any of the guests because I've enjoyed it. But there's something about, um, you know, the talk with, uh, Thomas Evung from Sweden, um, that it just captured my imagination. That was, to be honest, and I love, that's a part of the world I've never visited. And I'm just really, really interested in the history and the culture and the terrain and the wildlife and the people and everything. So, you know, purely for you know, his heritage and, and his, uh, his geographic location, that one just captured my mind. I, I really enjoyed that. And the second one, uh, was Tom Langhorn from Scotland. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I've kind of put it back to the same reasons that I have actually been to Scotland and I remember it being rolling hills and big mountains and big lakes and beautiful, beautiful country. And yeah, again, I was just kind of captivated by hearing stories of a place that I definitely want to get back to and explore properly. But also that um, he's just having a bit of fun, like he's running around and he killed. I mean, <laughs> he's just having a bit of fun, right? Yeah, mate. He's a American. And, and that, it's, 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 I was kind of thinking about it today, thinking... Uh, when I was debating whether to at all say if, if, if there was, um, ones that, that were highlights for me, and I was thinking there's no different to run around in a kilt to me, um, you know, throwing axes at a target in my backyard or doing archery or, 
yeah. making shields and fighting with my sons, you know, like just mucking around. It's all just, uh, I think it's just lighthearted, fun. I like it. No, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll double it. I'll second that. I think they were, um, they were tops, mate. They were all good. Good recap, mate. Um, yeah, you kind of pushed through the year and I had forgotten oh, I about Craig yeah. and Cass and how good that was too. And Yeah, that was a good chat. I feel can, like that's They can it. chat all night. I love it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that there's definitely been instances uh, with guests where, I mean, we've said it straight up to a few guests, we need to reconnect with you again yeah. next year and yeah. and <clears throat> see what you've been up to, see where you're at because we're only just – um, yeah, that actually was a fantastic chat with Kaz and Chrissy that we only just scratched the surface, you know, like we literally just scratched the surface on their stories. Chrissy, yeah. They've got so much more to tell us. Yeah, totally. Uh, in, is there anything you wanted to add to that, mate, as far as guess? No, no, mate. I'm, um, I'm, I'm looking forward now. I'm starting oh, wow. to look forward to 2020 i'm sure we've I'm not, got i'm not quite there yet a recap going on and then um i was just gonna say some of the uh some of the tom's magical mystery something or other mashup i can't even say it i'm getting <laughs> tired um <laughs> some of the favorite yeah some of my favorites i scroll back through all the show notes today and there's definitely things as soon as they popped up, I just went, oh, I love that video or oh, I love that book or yeah, I love sure. that news article or whatever. Um, and I did say it in the last episode and I'm happy to stand by it that Bo Miles, Bo Mile, um, his YouTube channel was, I still put that... Down as one of my best finds of 2019. Uh, also taking into account um, Tom Langhorn from Scotland. That was another fantastic YouTube discovery. Yeah. Both good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, to think that yeah, we went yeah. from, we went from, you know, discovering his content to then having him on as a guest is just absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, got to ask the questions that you, you can never ask of a YouTube video. <laughs> That's right, man. Uh, Hatchet was a book by Gary Paulson and it follows the, uh, journey of, I think a 13 year old boy who gets, uh, his plane crashes in Alaska and he's out there for a couple of months. Wow. Uh, it's it's not a true story, but it's a fantastic story, and it reads well. Um, you'd kind of give it to a to a teenager or something to read. But I bought it for my sons, but I had a quick read myself, and and I yes, like I said, as soon as I saw that pop up, I thought, yeah, that was a cool story. That it's definitely a good book. And Craig, do you remember that was episode eleven, episode twelve, when I introduced you to the world of for a Sturka. Yes. Full, <laughs> full strength. Full Sturka. Full strength. Full. Full strength. Yeah. Full strength. The Icelandic yeah, documentary so cool. about the rock lifting guys. I've shown so many people that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> such a good, such a good thing. Uh, yeah. Can't believe I discovered that as well. Uh, and that was the, um, around the time I read Born, Born to Run. Okay. As well and reviewed that book, which. Uh, I said it before, I'll say it again, one of the two books that has kind of changed my life in the last year. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't got to that yet. I will. Um, I will. Yeah, you should since you're into your running and stuff. Yeah. Um, you'll kick yourself that you didn't read it earlier. Yeah. Episode 14, Wolfpack popped up. Remember yeah. Remember that short film? That was so good. Oh, I'm going to go watch it again this weekend, I reckon. Yeah, so if you guys are just listening into this and haven't gone through the show notes, those couple of those that you've just mentioned there, go and check them out because they're awesome. Yeah, I'll probably end up putting all of these back into this episode's show notes so you don't have to 
you actually cool. go back through all the other pages, you'll just see uh recap. Yeah, like a recap of of the, um, some of my favorite stuff. Uh Wolfpack. Oh yeah, that was the same episode that I reviewed Thylacine, Tragic Tale of the Tasmanian Tiger book. Uh, cause that was around the same time I bought that book in Tasmania and we had, uh, we saw the Wolfpack film at the film festival. Mm -hmm. So that was fantastic. Great book. Sad, but a good lesson. Episode 16, discovered Tom from Fendavi Wilderness, who we were just talking about. Yeah. Episode 18, you'll remember this one. Remember that Mount Marathon trail run video I showed you? Oh, of the dudes just falling down the damn. side of that. Yeah, after we finished recording, you showed me the full thing. It was yeah, crazy. I did. That's right. Because, we, yeah, obviously, I, I just showed you a few um, yeah. sections. That's right. After no, I showed just you the whole thing, fell down that hill. they yeah. fly down this kind of, how do you describe it? That black shale. It's like black shale, isn't it, in parts? Yeah, it's like something off the moon. It's crazy. Yeah, and they're sliding down these scree slopes and just getting massacred on the way down. Everyone's covered in mud and blood. It's incredible. Uh, episode 19, I introduced you to the Yeti uh, cooler film, Denali's uh, Raven. That was the um, the plane that, Leanne Fally, she was that remote um, pilot that takes people out into the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had a chance to watch that? No, I kind Maybe of you remember you mentioned out. it. Okay. Yeah, you should check it out. It's a nice little film, 10 minutes or so. Great cinematography. Right. And that was also the episode we reviewed, My Year Without Matches. Oh, yep. Great Very book. Good. I think you've already answered my next question, which was going to be, um, have you had any takeaways or learnings from uh, any of the discussions we've had on the podcast, 29, any of the guests, um, yeah, or any of the insights from from listeners? Well. I, th um, I mean, I, I think you just answered the question before with your, um, yeah. with your comment, but... Well, looking forward, I've actually got um, plans to seriously take on some of the stuff Claire has just brought up last podcast, mate, with her um, <laughs> trying to trying to you know have a bit of wilderness in the city here. I'm setting up some some little quiet places out the back here. I've got a bit of a bushland that slopes steeply down to the creek, and yep. it's it's unused and it's not my land, but I'm gonna. I'm going to claim it. Well, yeah, it's public land. I'm going to get in there and um, set up a few little areas for me and the kids to hang out a lot more. And That's a good idea. Have it on our doorstep there. It makes sense. You know. It's just extending your backyard, which is really important. So that's I've really taken something from that to, to Yeah, put that's it, cool. Put I mean, I, I've, I've looked down there once, but I haven't actually been down there. I, I, it wouldn't take much to move a, move a log around or a couple of rocks or whatever and get a bit of... Um, mm. Bit of a spot going. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be good. Uh, it's a good idea. It's right. funny you say that because my um, one of the dot points I put down was get yourself a sit spot. Well, that's my, my yeah, yeah, exactly what I'm going. And I've got I've got one at home where I sit and read way down the back under the trees, uh, but I want to have a few more actually. Uh, I just want to make. I mean, it's part of getting myself another bathtub and putting it in the backyard was <laughs> just kind of like taking things. Uh, you know, how good does it feel when you're cooking on a barbecue out in the backyard rather than standing in your kitchen cooking? Yeah. Like yep. it just feels kind of cool, right? Yeah. That's well, I'd at. take that one step further to when you've been around my place when I've been cooking dinner on the fire down the back in, in yeah. big... Um, cast iron pots and stuff that's just epic and so i thought well let's take the um you know let's take the bath outside <laughs> uh i will be setting up a proper full undercover sort of bath and shower area where you can just uh you know if i'm doing gardening or whatever i can just wander over there and 
putting up some walls, yeah, I hope. Yeah. Uh, no, on one side there'll be a wall, maybe on two sides. <laughs> but um, I, I, I did the neighbours a favour and I only went out at, at, after dark last night. Hey, listen, before you ask me that question, I was going to say that um, I don't have a long list of, of, of things that I read because I don't read much. But yes, truly, I think about it often, is the, the Totem Pole by Paul Pritchard. Yeah, you, I did see that one pop up and I haven't read it yet. You haven't read it yet? No, no I think I want to get... Um, I think I want to get a signed copy sent up to me as well. No, I mentioned it um, in one of the episodes that we met this um, awesome bloke and had a good chat with him and a meal with him actually. And then I took his book home and yeah, I, I, I read it from front to back pretty quickly because I just couldn't couldn't stop and loved it. And it, it taught me a lot about his just determination to recover from a massive injury that he had from climbing and... Um, yeah, now I now I follow him on on social media and see his yeah, achievements yeah. these days and I, I He's I, over in Nepal, isn't he, at the moment? Yeah. He just took his son over there to yep. do some pretty big trekking over there. And that so that for really his son's birthday, I believe. Really affected me this year. So that, that oh, was that's a, cool. No, that was a big deal, that meeting Paul, for sure. Yeah, Paul was a good guy. I remember um eating some soup with him and then as soon as you said shared a meal, I remembered that. Amazing soup. It was good. I just eh? can't stop thinking about it every time I think about Tasmania. That Jeez. soup. <laughs> oh, it was good. I think about the conversations with our, our friends we made, mate. Oh, I was too busy eating soup. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, no, it was a good time down there. Um, that's why we met Andy. Yep. That was great. Uh, what else did I have written down? Oh, okay. So I had a couple of dot points and I had, um, simple pleasures are important. Reading, cooking over an open fire, looking at the stars, smelling the rain coming or even standing in the rain. And the next dot point was to slow down, which I think you could kind of mix that all in together. I don't know where I'm going with, with that statement, but it's something I've been focusing on since I've been working from home. I've had more time in my days because I'm not commuting two hours every day. So I'm introducing other things and, as I said, you know, slowing down. And I know everyone can't have that luxury and I don't know how much longer I'll have that luxury but when everything's moving so quickly around us, I think, uh, and it even goes for, if you're going for a hike, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with sitting down next to a stream and doing nothing. I think that's something that kind of changed for me fairly significantly this year. And when I, when I do the solo hike recently, I did exactly that. I sat down, I filtered some water, I just sat there hydrating in dead silence for quite a long time, doing absolutely nothing but just really soaking up the sounds and the smells and, uh, you know, looking at the scenery. Mm -hmm. I think it's too easy, and I know we've been guilty of it, to say, well... We need to get from A to B on this trip and we need to be there at this time and then we got to do this and then the next morning we're getting up early and we're going to smash out of camp early and we're going to get to this spot to take a quick selfie at the waterfall and then we're going to move on. And and then but I think what I learned this year was that it's okay to do half the travel and just really soak it up. And we did a lot of that on the Tasmanian hike, didn't we? Yeah, we had a lot of chance for that. We did. There was days where we would either have a short day hiking or else we would blast through the hiking deliberately to give ourselves an extended amount of time sitting by a stream making late lunch or um, when we sat by that lake and we had a swim and we uh, had lunch. That was yeah, yeah. that memory there, just that memory alone. I'll never, ever forget 
how the sun felt on us, you know, after the swim, just sitting there warming up and I just had so many delicious snacks. <laughs> yeah. I was just smashing beef jerky and cashew nuts and that's what Claire. Jelly beans. That's what Claire talked about. It's what it's the slowing down. It's about that mm. nature bathing. Was that what they called it? Um, forest, forest bathing. Forest bathing. Yeah. It's kind of. Um, I think it is something that you know. I'm as you say. You kind of develop it, uh, an affection for that. Yeah. More than just getting from A to B. Well, I think, uh, and I don't know if this is for everybody, but we definitely entered into the hiking world. In a, how would you say it, as a more of an adventure sport kind of approach. So we're like, oh, yeah, we're going to climb mountains and we're going to, you know, sleep under a tarp and we're going to complete this trail and tick this off the list. And it took um, quite a long time before I thought, well, it doesn't matter if I go back to the same place and sit there for three hours and just watch the clouds move around the top of a mountain top or something. You know, when I say that, I'm thinking of Echo Point, just how long you can sit out on that point mm -hmm. and be fully entertained by the way that the clouds wisp around the top of the peaks uh, is just that in itself. I mean, I was there a couple of months back with my nephew and we did exactly that. Again, we sat on that point. And hardly spoke for ages and just watched and it's just beautiful stuff. Mate, it is, you're talking about an evolution because you asked me to think back over the year for this um, chat tonight and I, I went right back and thought about exactly what you just said, how we used to be pretty, you know, gung-ho at, at our adventure sort of strategy and approach and we used to, you know, t take things as hard as we could. Yeah. And we got a lot out of that, but it was, I think that was where we were at at that point in our life. And I, I think about Ginger in, in her, you know, later years of life. And you know that I am face to face with elderly people, elderly or people in, you know. You're not allowed to say you're that. You're not allowed to say that. Dang. You'll be, I'm sending the next people who email are to hang on, you. Hang on. People who are retired, people who are, you know, approaching, let's just say that people. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Good luck, I, mate. I'm what, just, what, I'm, I'm just going to sit back here and listen. You keep going. You're doing well. <laughs> so they, <laughs> What's those... that about old people, mate? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, you weren't talking about uh, old people. Was I talking? Okay. Older people. Right. And I have several um, people that I've met who tell me about their journeys, even in their 60s, 70s, even 80s, mate. That they get out and um, and I mean bushwalking clubs and and they're loving it. I'm sure that their experience has moved and has, as you say, it might be more about, you know, just maintaining some sort of fitness or it might be whatever it is that, that gets them there, you know? Mm. And so, yeah, I, I, I remember I, I'm at a different point now and it's, you know, several years in where it is about slowing down a little bit in terms of getting my headspace with the outdoors just so I can get to the next level of learning and... Yeah, and, and I think I'd have to be honest and say I don't think it's just age. I th almost feel like um, if we started hiking 10 years earlier than we did, mm -hmm. I think we would have got to this point 10 years sooner. I, I can't truly believe that. Oh, to be honest, that's what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm assuming that some people have been doing it a lot longer than me. Is what yeah, I'm no, because I think there's that. Well, there's a, something around, oh, well, if you're uh, – in your 20s or your 30s and you're hiking, you're going to be doing all this extreme stuff, and you are, but I still think we would have got to this point eventually, mm -hmm. um, which here's the thing. I was uh, canoeing when I did that solo canoe trip, and I canoed past these people who were obviously bird watchers. They were creeping along the bank and had their... Uh, binoculars out and there was a big uh kind of a hawk or an eagle was circling around and they're looking at it and and i remember paddling past going oh what a pack of weirdos yeah <laughs> just if i want to alienate some listeners right now you don't get it at that point I, in that's your right journey. i was thinking what the hell 
But I have to say that yeah. I've done more bird watching this year, or at least in the last 18 months, than I've done in my entire life. Heaps. It's because my sons are obsessed with, they've got about three or four bird identification books each, and I got them some binoculars for their birthdays last year. Yeah, good. So they're obsessed. Everywhere we go, they're hearing bird calls and saying, oh, what's that? Oh, hang on, I think it's this one. And then, or they're identifying birds, or we're seeing a bird, having a look at it as much as we can, and then when we get home, we go straight to the reference books and try and identify it. And like, like I said, I've I know more about I've learned more about birds in twelve months than I have my entire life. Birds that I've seen my entire life, I didn't know the names of, and now I do, and that's because other people have introduced me to that. The uh, what would you say? How to be enthusiastic and how to take enjoyment from such a simple pleasure. Now I still don't consider myself a bird watcher, but I'm definitely I appreciate, well, you've seen me before when I've just stopped and started whispering and just on the trail and going, mm-hmm. oh, check it out. There's a little tiny finch there. And, uh, yeah. I still think you're a weirdo for doing that, but that's all right. Yeah, but you, eventually you will uh, I'll come around. surpass your uh, egotistical self <laughs> and you'll end up in a zen-like state like me <laughs> where you can watch birds. <laughs> Oh man. Uh, oh man. I think I actually can't kind of getting a little bit deep here in saying that I think we are forever like learning. We want we have to to keep it interesting. You have to learn to move to the next level with this. So yeah, I hope you guys have had, you know, a year where you have developed and moved from from one point to the next with your your hiking and adventures cuz Yeah, it's that's what it's all about. It's um I think it's important to find some, I mean, you could look at it in one way and say, find some holes in your game and, and try and work on those. Perhaps it's as simple as your fitness and maybe that's what's stopping you getting to certain places. Uh, that's an, that's probably the easiest one to work on. Um, improving your gear, doing more research on trails. But I do think that whilst you might have, um, goals of you know climbing mountains a lot of people are into getting uh, as many mountains under their belt as they can I, I have absolutely i think that's fantastic there's absolutely nothing wrong with that uh at the same time you know i think uh inevitably we need to find those times to just sit and enjoy the view or watch the stream or watch the wildlife yeah hmm well, it's getting heavy. I better, uh, I better say something silly and get it all lighthearted again. <laughs> <laughs> Fix this up, man. Fix this uh, up. Whatever round us out. I, I will go back to my earlier comment though, and I did have that written down as a, as one of my learnings from this year was it. It's okay to dress in a kilt and run around in the wilderness. <laughs> Amen. And I don't just mean that uh, literally. I just mean what that encapsulates, like what that means beyond actually doing that. It's okay to, to um, you know, jump in a, a stream and, you know, with no clothes on <laughs> and swim mm-hmm. and have a laugh. It's okay to lay to lay in a field or, or um, lay on some warm rocks in the afternoon and just kind of watch the clouds go over like it's just okay to be a kid out there we're we're um we're too too stringent about leaving these things behind because we're those those things are for um you know younger people or whatever but i'm telling you you've got to get back to it the sooner the better Mm, that's good i'll uh i will take a second just to thank our sponsors they've been incredibly generous uh, throughout the year, they all help us in different ways. Um, some with pr- product or services, um, and yeah, they're 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 fantastic supporters of the podcast, and uh, it's really great when you guys go and check them out, and and that does that information does get back to us, and and it's great to hear that um, 
that you're supporting them as well. It means a lot to us. They're good people. At the end of the day, I spend a lot of time talking to these people and they're fantastic people. And uh, that's what makes it better for me to kind of have those relationships. Uh, also, each and every person who's ever listened to an episode uh, of the podcast or watched a video or liked or commented on a post, um, sent me a, a Facebook message or Instagram message, uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel or left a review or sent us an email or just whatever. Every single piece of interaction is, um, I get excited. I love it when we hear from you guys. I love it when we learn stuff. I love it when we just have a good laugh and we're all sharing in this wonderful, uh, adventure it's not just hiking it's beyond hiking it's whatever you want to do in the outdoors but thanks for coming on the journey guys i joked about it earlier about this being the last podcast and it won't be we're going to be back in 2020 i can't say that or promise anything that uh, um you know to be honest we'll we'll take a nice break over christmas won't we craig Hmm. and uh, reevaluate things. But we will be back um, early in the new year and we'll start sending some fantastic guests your way. I've already got a few tentatively lined up that are keen uh, with some amazing stories. So also we've got a few of our own episodes we want to pump out to get a bit of information over to you. So thank you. Thanks for still being here after all this time. And uh, thanks for, I mean, it makes it easier when we know there's people out there enjoying it. As uh, Craig and I alluded to, I think, last episode. Last year, we, we got out 10 episodes. And this year, with the inclusion of this, it'll be 12. And I'm pretty proud of um, the extra effort. I know we've crammed in a few in the last, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> life has got in the way, unfortunately, in the last couple of months with a few family emergencies for us, but it's all good. Anything else to add to that, Craig? Yeah, I want to say a big Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for yeah. joining us throughout the year. I guess I, I hope that everyone continues to be inspired to enter the wild and I want to keep this conversation going. So looking forward to 2020. Yeah, good stuff. And I guess... Uh, I'm not big on New Year's resolutions because I think that uh, you shouldn't wait till the New Year's to New Year to get into things. But uh, whatever floats your boat, if if hiking something that you want to pursue a little differently in uh, the coming year, then I don't know. Reach out to us. Let us know. There might be uh, a particular person or subject that we can hit and help you along on that journey. Otherwise, we'll just have a good time and. I'll uh, get things wrong a lot and you can laugh at it. <laughs> All right. You done, Craig? All good. All right. This Christmas party is almost over. Yeah. Guys, have an absolutely fantastic festive season wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Stay safe. I hope you spend as much of it as you can in the wilderness. Thanks so much. We will talk to you next year. Love you guys. Thanks. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, we'd really appreciate your ratings and comments if you can spare the time. If you'd like to know more about Hike or Die TV and keep track of our adventures around Australia, make sure you drop by hikeordie.com. That's where you'll find all the information you'll need to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Pinterest. As always, we appreciate your support. Thanks for listening.